Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wreck like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Hmm. Now, what does it mean to be saved by grace? I'm sure you've heard that song some place, maybe. Um, because the words of this famous hymn by John Newton, they seem to resonate with people of all theological persuasions. It is performed in churches of all kinds, from evangelical Christians to Roman Catholics, to mainline uh, liberal to Mormons, all, all, all those, they, they play that song. It has been recorded by countless artists, from Johnny Cash and Elvis Presley, to the three tenors, to Rascal Flatts and Alan Jackson. And the concept of, or at least the word, grace is firmly planted in our culture. So now, I'm going to read uh, just an article here, which uh, totally resonates with me and resonates to my heart, concerning what grace is all about. And... Uh, concerning what exactly it is it means to be saved by grace i know many people just hear that you're saved by grace and they don't understand so i'm going to try as much as possible to explain to you what that grace means um of god of course trying to uh just put pull in some words from this article that i'm reading here and also trying to show you some few bible verses and let's let's communicate let's understand this grace okay so now the concept of grace as found in the bible is multifaceted all right it has different faces somehow people understand it in different ways but i want you to understand but it can be summed up in the definition undeserved favor grace is basically something that you don't deserve something which is just is given to you undeservingly all right the bible says that we are saved by grace and the grace of god is expressed by god's forgiveness of our sins and his blessings to us include peace and fulfillment in this life and in the life to come all right and deterred fellowship with him for all eternity. Just as the song, Amazing Grace, the one you just uh, I've just sung for you here. Uh, this grace has gained almost universal acceptance. Everybody understands about grace. And they say, yeah, it's all about grace. Yeah, we are saved by grace. But not really many people understand what this grace is all about. All right? It is difficult to find any religious expression with roots in Christianity that does not extol the virtues of grace. Everybody talks about grace. But do we really understand what grace is all about? No one with even minimal exposure to Christianity would be so crass as to claim that he has lived a life of such sterling character that God owes him eternal life. Saved by grace. <sighs> All right. The vast majority will admit that they have been, they have probably some shortcomings and I need of God's grace in some form. However, there is much understanding about being saved by grace. A great Many who call themselves Christians assume that the grace of God has established a system whereby the sinner can mitigate his deserved punishment by his own efforts. For example, you say, I will try to do good so that I can mitigate my sins. I will try to be a good person so that I can mitigate the bad things that I've done. I will try to give to the poor so that probably God can have some mercy on me. That's not grace. 
For some, this may be a formal system of sacraments that infuse the soul with the grace of God. For others, the system is less formal but still includes various religious activities such as church attendance, uh -huh, baptism, contributing, the offering and things like that, and of course doing good deeds. While most people agree that there is nobody perfect, nobody is perfect, many say that God in his grace will overlook our sins if he sees that you have made a genuine effort to do the right thing. Like we have tried to mend our ways. Or maybe try to avail ourselves in, in uh, you know, in different situations, maybe to help the poor. We've tried to contribute to our children's home and, and things like that. And, and we think that God is going to show us grace because we did this. Is it making some sense? So, <laughs> you see, many people think God is going to do something to us. He's going to grant us salvation if he sees if he sees that the trajectory of our lives is headed in the right direction, then in his grace, you see, it's like, because I've done this, God then in his grace is going to see what I have tried to do and, and offer me grace. That is not grace. The sinner does not earn eternal life in an absolute sense. He earns it in no way. He doesn't earn it. Like he, There's no way you can say, I've earned grace or I've, I've done something which makes God have some mercy on me. No, that's not grace. If there's something you did so that God can have mercy on you, then that's not grace. I'm not talking about faith. I'm talking about doing something. I've tried to be good. I've tried not to sin. I've tried not to... I've tried this. I've tried to do this. You see? Everything that you try to do, then that's not grace. Alright? In this view of grace, the sinner does not earn eternal life in an absolute sense. But his penitent response and genuine effort does trigger a gracious response from the Father. This belief, although widespread, contradicts the true meaning of grace. Or unmerited favor. Have you heard people who tell you, you have to trigger God in some way by trying to, you see, I, I did this and this and then God saved me. It's not like that. God does not save you because of something that you triggered him to. It's all about understanding. You hear the gospel, you understand it, and you believe it. And you activate the grace the grace using faith. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It tells us very well about what exactly this grace is all about. Let me show you something here. Alright. Ephesians uh, 2, verses 8. Let's look at this. Let's analyze this grace. Okay. Let's analyze this. For by grace are you saved. It is grace that you're saved. But how will you be saved? How will that unmerited favor come on you? It is through faith. Are you seeing this? For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Are you seeing there is nothing that you have triggered? It is nothing of yourself. It is not because I went to some church or did some things and then God saw, wow, this guy was doing really good things. He, he, he is a good guy, so let me try to give him this grace. No, it's not like that. It is basically unmerited favor. Only through faith. You put your faith in Christ and you got that grace. So grace is not because uh, I've, lately I've been with Christians so much and I feel it's like God is trying to call me because I try so much to stay with Christians. No, that's just staying with Christians. Because I go to church lately so much, I, I, I tend to feel that, you see, it's like, it's, Somehow I feel as if I love God because I'm, I'm going to church. I'm doing these things. That's, that's not grace. Grace is something which only comes by faith. 
Who have you put your faith in? If your faith is in your friends or is in your church or is in the things that you do, then the faith is in a wrong thing. If your faith is in something that you think, it's in a wrong thing. Because faith is only in the blood of Jesus that he shed for you. In the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's where the faith should be in. And once you activate the faith in that, then now you get the grace. Are you seeing this? Because the Bible tells us in verse 9, Not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not about the work that you do. It's not about the good things. It's not about anything. It's not about works. Grace is only through faith. It is only through faith that you get the grace. You get in the point? But of course, there are people who say, you know, people confuse Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, and they confuse it with Ephesians 2, 10. You see, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it tells us how we are saved. We have been saved by grace through faith, not of works, you know, lest anyone should boast. It's okay, we have been saved. Now, after you've been saved, something happens. You become a new creature. And that's where now Ephesians 2.10 applies. Are you getting the point? That's where exactly where Ephesians 2.10 applies. Because now we can see here, we are already born again. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. You see, we are already created. We are already born. We are already a new creature. We are already made new. But what is the reason that we have been made new? First, to obtain eternal salvation and number two if it was only about getting eternal salvation and then then we could just be saved and gone to heaven immediately but after we've been saved we stay here for a while so that we can work for god and bring others to christ that's why ephesians 2 10 says for we are his workmanship <coughs> excuse me we are his workmanship created in christ jesus unto good works you see, we have been created, we have been made new for his good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, you, are you seeing the difference between Ephesians 2.10 and Ephesians 2.8.9? One, we have been saved by grace through faith. Then, after we have been saved, then we are supposed to do good works. So, our salvation does not come by works or doing good. It comes by faith only. That is what we call grace, unmerited favor. All right? Got the point there? <laughs> okay. All right. Let's continue. Now, this example that I'm going to give you, it may help illustrate the above view of grace. All right? The kind of grace that people think is what saves them. You see, people tend to believe, I triggered something and then God had mercy on me. I want to give you an example of how people think and how they perceive grace. And to prove to you that the way they perceive it is not the right way of grace. Grace is not something you trigger. Now, this, this is an example of how people perceive grace, alright? Think about this. A teenager works hard all maybe a holiday, during some holiday, to save money to buy a car. He's working very hard. And uh, he's working on a regular job and does some yard work or some whatever kind of job he does. And some all other jo or odd jobs on the side. And he saves his money and does not spend it in whichever bad way or recklessly. Nevertheless, at the end of the, of the holiday or this time that uh, he's been working... He simply does not have enough money to buy a car that will meet his needs. Uh -huh. I want you to see this point. His father, seeing his diligence and frugality, graciously steps in and not only makes up the difference, but also adds money to the car, to the car fund, so that his son can buy a car that is better than he thought he could ever afford. Are you seeing this point? I want to show you how people perceive grace. Now, a son has worked very hard. He wants to buy a car. He has been saving. He's been doing everything that he can do. But he doesn't make the goal having enough money to buy this car. And then, <laughs> the son's best effort was, was not good enough. 
They, he tried so much. But the father's grace makes up the difference. That's how people think. Because the father saw this son trying so much to buy that car. Then the father said, okay, let me, let me help you. Let me give you some more money or let me buy the car for you. And uh, that, that's not grace. This is how people perceive grace. And they think it's because I was trying so much and then God saw my effort and then he gave me grace. So if you tried, then is that grace? It's not unmerited favor. All right? No one would claim that the father was obligated to make up the difference. All right? So when he does, it is an act of grace. That's what people say. So they say if the son had been fired from his job for showing up late and lazed around at the pool every day instead of working or had spent whatever money he had on maybe fast foods and, and uh, video games, then the father would not have stepped in to make up the difference. It would be incorrect to say that the son earned the car, for he did not, but his effort did trigger, trigger a gracious response from his father. Now, looking at this, I will understand how people perceive grace. They will say, this child tried so much to gather some money and to work hard to buy that car, but because he could not be able to meet that, then the father saw it and said, wow, my son is trying so much. Let me go and help him out. And they say now, this is grace. Is that really grace? Is this really grace? No, it's not grace. Because this child tried to work to earn that car. It's the same way people can say, I tried so much giving to the poor, doing this, this, and this, and then God saved me at the end of the day. I was in the church since when I was born, since when I was young, I stayed in church and church and church and I, and I prayed and I gave tithes and I did all these things and then God had mercy on me and saved me along the way. That's not true. And that's why the Bible says in, in Matthew chapter 7 that on that day many will say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy, cast out demons, do mighty great works in your name? And he'll tell them, depart from me that work iniquity. Why? Because of one thing. People tend to be comfortable when you're in a certain area and you tend to behave like those people. When you're in church so many times and you go to church in the morning, in the evening, in the afternoon, you'll tend to kind of think that you're saved. You'll tend to kind of think that you know God and he knows you, but he doesn't know you. I gave you my story so many times of how I was in church since when I was a young person. I was born and raised in Pentecostal church. I was singing in the choir, Sunday school, I even preached to the teens, I did everything because I was familiar with the, with the church things and, and the Bible and we always we went to church every Sunday and, and, and through being in the church area and you know, hello, praise God, praise God, this and that, and I was acclimatized and, and I thought I was saved. And so many times we prayed and said, oh, the sinner's prayer, please Jesus come into my heart. But I had never really understood Jesus himself, and he never knew me. Until the day I, I had some two weird dreams, I saw that, hey man, I've been left by the rapture. And two weeks later, I saw again another dream, I've been left by the rapture. And I'm there trying to organize people and tell them, okay, this is how we are supposed to do, the Bible says this. And I was like, why am I seeing this? Why am I seeing myself organizing people and what they need to do? Because I know the Bible, yes, but why am I here? Why have I been left behind? And God starts speaking to me, telling me, Keith, you may be in church, but I don't know you. You've never accepted the gift that I've given. You've never accepted me. You've never accepted this payment that I paid for your sins. You've just been in church and you've stuck and uh, you just think because you're always in church, you're a good person. That's what most people are doing. And that's how they think that because I've done some works, I'm really good, I'm really good, I'm in church, I'm helping, I'm going to the crusades, I'm, I'm giving to the poor, I'm, I'm giving my tithes and my offerings and all those things. I think I am saved. I, I kind of think I'm saved because I'm always in church. That's not grace. That's not grace. 
that's not grace. And I thank God when when God put this in my heart, I I did not look behind. I did not start uh, arguing and saying, "Oh, you see, God, but I'm, I've been saved like most of the people or most of us do." Many times I I could hear God trying to tell me, "Keith, you need to uh, understand the gospel." But I was always, <laughs> "How do I understand the gospel?" And I've been in church. You see, you can just laugh about it and say, "Ah, oh, God, come on." <laughs> Don't, don't you always see me in church? Uh, come on, I'm, I'm a good guy. I even pray. I even uh, pray for every meal before I... I remember those days I, I, I used to drink. Um, of course, I'm not saying alcohol is bad. Of course, drunkenness is bad. But I used to be a drunk. And uh, sometimes I could go to the bar and uh, just before I take my liquor, I, I was like, okay, God bless. I remember, okay, do I have to pray for this? Anyway, it's sin. So y- you see those kind of kind of thoughts that people you are so acclimatized to the things of god and until you think that but i'm one of i'm one of these guys but when jesus comes he will see me because i'm always in the church and i always thought because i carry a bible because i go to church every sunday you know I have already received the grace that's not true absolutely that's not true that is not what we call saved by grace that is saving yourself by trying to do good works by trying to be a great person in church and things like that so that story <clears throat> the story i've just given you about this uh, son gives us a picture of how people perceive grace but that's not the truth because according to the bible this is not grace grace is undeserved favor it is god's blessing on the unworthy in the example which i just gave above the father bestowed his favor because he felt his son's effort should be rewarded. He felt that, oh, these efforts of my son, they should be rewarded. And that's not how God works. God does not reward our efforts. He gives us unmerited favor, which we don't deserve. That is what we call grace. All right? So, the father's gift was based on a genuine effort by the son and was therefore not true grace. It was not grace. It was the effort of the son and the father just chipped in. That's God does not work that way. He works in a very different formula. Because Jesus illustrated true grace with the story of a father who received his runaway son with celebrations and joy. A totally unworthy individual who bought, brought nothing to his father except dishonor, shame, And this child, this boy, he was lavished with undeserved blessings. And I want us to go there and we read this story so that you can be able to understand. In the book of Luke uh, 15, uh, verse 11. All right. I will show you the story of the prodigal son. And tell me if this was a... Did he work for anything? Did he deserve this favor which his father gave him? Tell me if he did. Let's look at this story. The Bible says... A certain man had two sons, okay? And the young, the young of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that uh, falleth to me. Give me everything which is mine. Give me. I want to do my own things. And he divided unto them his living. So he said, okay, you son A and son B. Son B, get this. Do your thing. Son A, of course, they remain there for, for a while. So this son has taken whatever he wants and is gone. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with the riches living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land and he began to be in want. Alright? So remember, he has already spent everything. He's already eaten everything. Now a famine comes and now he needs to eat, he needs to wear, he needs to have a good life. But now it's, uh, it's done. Him and his father, they are, you know, kaput. And he went and joined himself to a citizen um, of that country. And he sent him into his field to uh, feed swine. So in simple terms, let me explain. So he went and got a job in a place whereby there were some pigs. And uh, you have to understand, as a Jewish person... Because Jesus was talking was giving this uh, story to to Jews, so definitely they, they they perceive and they know this this story on a Jewish perspective. Jews, one of the things that they really detest is 
is uh, <laughs> you know pigs it seemed to be an unclean animal so this boy going to feed pigs is something which was perceived to be the dirtiest of all dirtiest things so it means he had no other option he was just he was done there was no okay let me stop explain let me just show you and he would f he would feign and he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat and no man gave unto him so he was also eating the food from the pigs C can you imagine the f what the pigs eat and that's what he was eating because there's nothing else he can do and when he came to himself when he came to himself this is where the point is you have to come to yourself come to your senses and realize i am a sinner i am a sinner deserving death you see unless you dis you understand yourself you come to yourself and you understand oops Keith, i'm lost the way i i understood that day and i told myself you mean all this time i've just been in church doing nothing then i deserve to be i i i i, I deserve to know the gospel let me look for the gospel because i know i'm lost i came to myself i i discovered and say Keith, you're lost you need now to understand the gospel. You need to hear the gospel. Where am I going to find the gospel? And uh, thank God, uh, when I was doing researches online and I prayed to God and God showed me Robert Breaker, he was preaching and, and I got to hear the message of the, of the gospel and I got to be saved because the Bible says that seek me and you will find me. When you decide, when you first make that up, that, that thought and you say, now I have understood that I'm lost, then something happens. Because unless somebody understands he's lost, because there are so many people in church today who are really lost. And they cannot admit that they are lost. They cannot. They, they always say, no, I'm not, I'm not lost. I'm, come on, I'm, I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor. I'm, I'm a bishop. There are others who are even bishops. And you ask them, brother, when did you get saved? When did you get saved? They'll tell you, uh, you see, um, I just be, be, I've been raised in church and blah 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 and blah 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 all those kind of things and I went to theological college. Going to theological college doesn't make you a Christian. Doesn't make you a saved person. You can go and study theology and have a master's and PhD and still go to hell. <laughs> People have never understood. It, like for example, if I go to Afghanistan and I say I want to learn Islam, I want to go to Madrasa and and study Islam, does it mean that I believe in Islam? No. Maybe I've just studied some career because I want to open a mosque and uh, make some good money. The same thing. You see, salvation is a relationship. You have to understand first, I am lost. Now, let's come back to the story here. Enough said. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough to spare? And I perish with hunger. These are some questions that you should ask yourself. I'm here doing all these things, lost as I could ever think. But salvation is free. Jesus died for my sins. I'm trying to work out my salvation. While it is Christ who's supposed to work in me, where is the Holy Spirit? Why am I so lost like this? The moment you start asking yourself these questions, the moment you start questioning things, the Bible says, question everything. You see, the Bible tells us, question everything. Don't just be given any doctrine and told, you're a good person, start singing in the choir. Now, all of a sudden, you're called, oh, Brother Keith. You can call me Brother Keith and I still head to hell. The titles and all those things, they don't add anything if you don't know the gospel. All right? This guy said, uh, verse uh, 18, he said, uh, I will arise and go to my father. Make a decision. You have realized that you're lost. You have realized that you're lost. Then you make a decision. I will arise and go to my father. And I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned again in heaven and before thee. So this boy has realized that he has sinned. And number two, he's looking for the good news, the gospel. He's looking for his father. You understand that you're lost. And then you now look for the gospel. You say now, I need to hear the truth. I need to hear the truth. Let me head now and look for the truth. Where is that truth? Where is that truth? Okay? <clears throat> and say, I am not worthy to be called thy son. 
make me as one of thy hired servants. You see, this is a picture of someone who now understands what grace is all about. You tell yourself, I will go and look for the gospel because um, my works are not worthy of anything. Even if I work how much, even if I try to do how much, it cannot give me salvation. I can go to heaven be based on what I'm doing. I can I have now understood that all this is vanity for me. Everything this this vanity for me. Now I need to find the true gospel and go and tell God, Jesus, please please be my Lord and my Savior. I can't save myself. I can give to the poor as much as I can. I can give a thousand a thousand thousands and thousands of of money every time to the church but still i will go to hell i can do this i can do that but it's not helping me now you realize that you need grace all right and he arose and came to his father but when he was yet a great way off his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him are you are you seeing this one god always is waiting he has compassion on you. He knows you. He knew you before you were born. He knew that you're a sinner and he needs to save you. He has compassion for you. When Jesus was at that cross dying for the sins of the world, he was not even looking at these soldiers who are piercing him and, and spitting on him and, and doing all those things to him. He was basically having compassion on them and saying, I'm also dying for you. Even you who is hitting me, I'm dying for you. I have compassion for you. That's exactly what grace is all about. And ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. That's, that's the love of God. Look at this. This is the love of God. When he was yet a great way off, far off, the moment personally myself, I discovered Keith had been lost in this church. It's now 30 years. Now I'm 33. All right. It's, it's over 30 years. And I'm there and asking myself, I've been in church all these years. I, I, I do all these good things, but why am I seeing that I'm, I'm, I may go to hell? Why am I seeing these things? And the moment I start looking for the truth, because the Bible says, look for the truth even if it's, 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 it's by, I, I don't know, I'm, I know it in my native language, but the way you can do it like this, you know, it's like you're looking for a matchbox in the darkness. God is going to say, come up here. I, I can see you. That's exactly how the father of this big, uh, this son lost son did he saw him from very far and he was like this this boy is looking for me and he ran and he hugged him and kissed him and told him this is me you're looking for me that's exactly how god is going to do it when you start looking for him lord where, where is the truth i don't know is it is it john 3 16 is it first corinthians 15 1 through 4 is it is it in zechariah Ma malachi you're trying to look you don't know where the truth is god is going to tell you come here I can see you because God is light and that's how he did it. I, will, I, I never went to any church to, to, to be prayed for, for salvation. The moment I realized that I'm lost, I told God one thing. I don't know which church is telling me the truth. There's this church, there's this church, there's this pastor, there's this pastor, there's this preacher. I don't know all these people. I don't, I don't understand who is telling me the truth. I, it's just like you kick everything on your table and you say, God, show me the truth. Because all these other things, I can't really understand who is true. This one, this one, this one. Now, all of them, they are saying different things. Now, as a, as a zero believer, as someone who is young, I don't know what is true. And along the way, I remember God just asked me one thing. Keith, what do you have? I said, I just have a mobile phone and some data. And uh, God was telling me, that's where you're going to know the truth. And I started doing some research and just God put something in me that I, I, I enjoyed so much learning about the end times and the end times and who are the two witnesses, who are the one for 4,000, what's the mark of the beast, blah, blah, all those kind of things. And along the way, I got to see a video of Robert Breaker talking about the two witnesses and, and, and I watched and, and I was like, what's this guy trying to talk about on a white, on a white board? And uh, I was like, let me skip, but something just telling me, hold on, hold on, just hold on, just, just check what he has to say. And I waited and I watched and by the middle of the video, it, I, it, I, I started feeling like, you know, that, that sense you start feeling, I need to hear more. I think this is what I'm looking for. I need to hear more. And 
I continued over and over and uh, I checked another sermon and another sermon and all of a sudden I started reading the Bible and I'm like, is this guy saying what, what the Bible is saying or am I hearing my own things? Because I remember that's the time that I bought uh, this Bible, okay? And I was like, whatever he's saying, I want to confirm because uh, I've never had these things in my life. I've always heard about the love of Jesus, you know, Jesus will do this for you, he'll buy you a car, he'll buy you this, and, and if you, you face troubles, it's because uh, you've done something wrong. And here he's talking about that salvation is free. I had to read the Bible and ask myself, Breaker, are you really saying the truth or what is this? I so said, reading, reading, going over, and I can see clearly this is the word of God and, and this and this. And, and from there, God opened up the way because... Unless you look for him, you look for that, you take away all the things that you think that I'm saved because I do this, I'm saved because I'm this good person, I'm saved because I am this, I've done this, I, 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 I. Remember in the book of Isaiah chapter 14, Satan was saying, I will ascend, I will be like the most, I'll go to the sides of the north, I will be, I, I, I. You see, anytime you try to say, I've done this, that's the spirit of Satan trying to tell you how good you are and how much... <laughs> Are you getting the point here? All right. Look at this. Luke 15, 20. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I'm not worthy to be called thy son. I'm not worthy. I'm not, I'm not supposed to be called your son. I'm not worthy to be saved. But save me by your unmerited favor, your grace, Lord. You promised me that you would save me. I put all my faith in you. Save me. That's exactly a picture of this. And I'll read you 24 and finish up there. And, uh, all right, uh, verse 22. But the father said unto his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to marry. That's how God is going to receive you. You're like, Lord, please. It's like God tells you, shut up. Shut up. Don't tell me your, your problems and your sins. Jesus, you know I lied yesterday. He doesn't want to hear that. Jesus, you see, I did. Keep quiet. Bring the best robes put on this son of mine but jesus you shut up bring the ring put on his finger but jesus you see keep quiet look for some calf you know let's make merry let's enjoy this 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 boy was lost but now he's found have you seen the point here that's exactly how god accepts you he looks at you and says you are lost and he looked at me. I remember that time and, and, I, and I felt God telling me, Keith, this is it. I, I could not even believe. I, I, I was, really? Really? And God strengthened my belief in him. It took me so, so much time to keep on understanding. You mean I've been saved freely? I don't have to pay anything. I've been in church all through. They've been telling me you have to do this and pay that and give tithes. And, 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 and I remember when I told to my old pastor, and told him, now I know the truth. And I thank God that he showed me the truth. And, and all these things that... Uh, of course, I, I spoke my mind. I'm one guy who is always straight to the point. I told him, Pastor, you've never told me the truth. And I really felt so bad. And I told him, Pastor, you've always been telling me it's all about giving tithes and giving tithes and giving tithes. It's like I'm buying salvation. And I thank God he's shown me the truth. Do you know what that pastor told me? You're not going far. You're not going far. I was like... Dude, are you the one who takes people far? <laughs> You're a big joker. Huh? You've been lying to me all this time that I have to pay for salvation, pay for this. You know, if I need, I remember I used to travel even long distances just to go and see that preacher and give him some money to pray for me over this and pray for me over this. And I remember one day my my car had I had some issues it had spoiled some some few things and and I, it was somewhere in a garage and i was so confused and and feeling so bad because this this is the car that i used to supply things with you know i i used to do sales 
and uh, it's their stack is spoiled the, the gearbox has an issue i call that person and pastor now what am i going to do what do you feel that god is trying to tell you about me he tells me oh don't worry i want you to come come i pray and i went there and he prayed for me i gave some money and uh, you know just the the the, the way that all this bunch of hypocrites they try to lie to you and tell you that you have to pay something to be to get this it's like god you have to pay for everything here here nothing is for free that's how they live like and at the end of the day tells me oh three days your car will be up it never even got, got up and when everything spoiled and i could not give the tithes that i was giving every day because i used to work every day and i sent him money every day ten percent ten percent ten percent ten percent this 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 is a thug this is they're just thieves these are just thieves on the pulpit and they try to sell you the gospel they try to tell you you see and i remember sometimes he could tell me keith you have not given uh, the last two days huh? are you trying to steal from god are you trying to i'm like oh pastor no no mm, i will give for yesterday and the other day and and i'm there trying to think that i remember i, I had authored some books <laughs> and i i took the the money which i was selling my books 10 percent was is like this guy has had authored books with me are you seeing the point here are you seeing the way people can be fooled unless they understand what grace is that you need to do nothing the moment i understood that jesus saved me for free and i was listening to that that message and i went to robert breaker's uh uh the salvation series on his youtube and i watched one by one and i could hear can you lose your salvation the 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 teachings on the atonement the blood the blood of jesus and all those and and i was listening and i was like this is totally new you mean all these things have been free you mean all these things have been free and and i'm confirming with my bible i remember I used to tell us go and buy a king james bible and and i went and bought one because i used to use uh, some nivs and all these other and perverted bibles uh, and i i could read and and i'm like you mean this you mean i could not let me say i could not believe because now i believe right <laughs> but uh, this is what we call favor you read and you see this is what god is telling me this is what god's telling me and as as you grew in christ as you grow in christ he starts showing you much more and of course the biggest problem what what happens immediately you're saved is that uh, all of a sudden you 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 some legalism gets in you okay that's that's common immediately you feel like that person is a sinner no that's a sinner because where you've been before it's been people pulling you into different things so now you I remember I locked myself in my house and I was like, I, I, that's a sinner, that's a sinner, that's a sinner. But as God keeps on sharpening you and rightly dividing you, okay, he tells you it's not about running away from these people. It's about being the light. It's about being the salt of the world. It's about being there with them and telling them the gospel. Let your light shine. All right, and I said, you know, God balancing me, balancing me, balancing me. And I remember I did a lot of Bible study uh, with some lady. She was just someone on Facebook we met, and she was telling me, "Oh, please, I see you post some post on." And she told me, C "Can we be doing some Bible studies?" And and we said, "Okay, sure, we can do some Bible study on WhatsApp. We're just doing some on WhatsApp video, and we're just today God tells me." And I didn't know what to preach about. I didn't know what to say about. And every day. God reminds me, you have a Bible study to do, okay? So you have to prepare something, and I could go and listen to some things and, and come and say, oh, this is what God, uh, I feel God trying to show me on this verse. I, I don't know much, but we discuss and discuss and, and over and over, and some people joined us and, and things like that, and look where we are right now. And God has been opening more and more, and how many people have been able to hear the gospel through this ministry, through this online ministry that we preach and and I could not believe. And sometimes I, I was like, my heart is not believing, but God is telling me, Keith, this is the truth. This is the truth. And slowly, slowly, God kept on enriching my belief in him, enriching me more, making me understand him. And one day after another, my strength, my belief in him was strengthened, 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 until I came to come to the knowledge of the truth. 
That's exactly how God wants it to be. That's how God wants it to be. It took me much time even on Facebook just to post, you see Jesus this. Because I was a party boy. I was just any other guy. I, I was, you know, you live like the devil over the week. But on Sunday you're there shouting amen. And you see, that's how people live like. And they think I have a relationship because I go to church on Sunday. But God wants more than that. He wants you to have a relationship with him. All right. Let's, let's continue as, uh, as I speak about this. Now. So, we are saved by grace, not by a mixture of God's grace. And our meritious works, those do not save us. According to the scripture, we can do nothing to earn salvation, nor our best efforts good enough to elicit a gracious response from God, so that he will make up the difference. God does not wait, you do some things and then, no, he gives you that unmerited favor all by himself all you need to do is believe all our righteousness righteous deeds are as filthy rags do you know the bible tells us that everything we try to do is filthy rags let me show you this verse in the book of isaiah in the book of isaiah 64 6 it tells us about this if so if you're trying to do some righteous deeds and righteous things, this is what God says. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rugs. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Everything that we try to do is just wind, is nothing. It doesn't add up anything. Alright? So your righteousness, if you're trying to do good, like I did, like I was in church, preached, sang in the choir, do everything. But I was living like the devil. I never knew Christ. I could still, it was just filthy rags. God was just looking and saying, who is that singing on the choir? Who is that, that dirty boy called kid there trying to sing? What is he trying to say there? And God was, and I'm there trying, oh, Jesus, my Lord. Eh. You know, in Africa, we dance so much. Eh, you dance, you dance. And God is like, stop dancing. You're filthy rags. Know me first. That's exactly how God feels. Even considering our best efforts, we have fallen short of the God's standard of righteousness. Everything, we have fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. He tells us very well. For all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. And we deserve death. Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, we are not commanded to do our best. We are not commanded to do our best for God. But to, we are commanded to love him perfectly. Matthew. We are supposed to love him perfectly. Matthew 22 verse 37. All right. This is what we are commanded. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. All right. Love the, the Lord your God with all you have. Everything that you have. Everything that you have. We fail in all that. And the command is not to try to love our neighbors, but to actually succeed in loving our neighbors as we do love ourselves. The Bible told us about this in 39. Thou shalt love their neighbor as thyself. So, when you love your neighbor, most of this we call sins, they'll not be there. You not kill, you not lie, you not fornicate, you not do this because you're doing it because you love them. You love others and you love God. You love God so much that you don't want to do what is wrong. You love your neighbor so much that you don't want to do what is wrong. And everything is settled. That's the that's these two commandments. The Bible says in verse 40, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Everything is only those two commandments. Love your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. You cannot lie to yourself. You cannot kill yourself. You cannot do this. I'm not talking about those people who are possessed by demons and they're killing themselves. I'm talking about you in a, your natural mind. You can't kill yourself. You can't beat yourself. You can't steal from yourself. When you do that, my friends, then what other kind of sin is there? There's no other sin. <laughs> you seeing the point. But of course... I'm not talking about doing this for your salvation. Believe first. Get this unmerited favor by faith. And after that, 
then all you need to do is love. Love is the greatest commandment. Love your neighbor, love your friends, love love God, love ev- you know, love, 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 love. But I'm not saying love, love without justice is not love. If I see somebody is doing something wrong and I just say, oh, I love you so much, just keep on doing that. I, I know you're heading to a, to a hall and you're going to die, but I don't want to question you because, you see, I love you so much. And that's not love. God loved us so much that he has to punish us when you go wrong. He has to tell us and correct us when you go wrong. That is what love is. There can never be love without justice. There can never be love without truth. You have to tell somebody the truth. This person is doing wrong. I love you so much. I have to tell you this is wrong and this is going to send you to hell. That's love. You're getting the point here. All right. So in spite of our best efforts, we fail. And who can honestly claim that they, they, they gave it their best effort anyway? Who can claim because of my efforts, because I did this, I did this, I'm really good? Who? So people will often try to comfort those who realize their shortcomings by saying something like, don't be afraid, God knows your heart. As if that should be a comfort. That's not a comfort. If God knows our hearts, we are doomed. We are doomed indeed. There is no place left to hide. If, if it's all about our hearts, our hearts are wicked. The Bible says that our heart, the heart of man is wicked. So if it's about God knows your heart, then he knows how wicked you are. Alright? Our only hope is to place our faith in Jesus Christ who lived a perfect life, died on the cross to pay for our sins and rose again. Alright? And our sin is imputed to us uh, and his righteousness is imputed to us when we trust in him. And our sin is imputed on him. And he cleared that sin 2,000 years ago. So we get his righteousness when we trust in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 2 Corinthians 5.21 When you put your trust in Christ, then your sin is gone and you get his righteousness. For he has made him, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Understood? So we are not justified by our works. Let me show you Romans. <clears throat> Romans 3.20. Uh, 3.20, alright. <clears throat> Romans 3.20, it says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, shall no flesh be justified in its sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. By the law. If you think that law is going to give you justification, then <laughs> that law is going to just give you knowledge of sin. If you say, do not do this, do not do this, I did this good, I, I try to, you know, the law said, do all these good things. And you say, okay, I'm going to do all these good things so that I can get myself eternal life then that's not true that's not true you will go to hell with your good deeds but uh, doing good we do it so that we can get rewards in heaven after we've been saved but if you're doing good things and you're not yet saved it's all in vain it's just like the way you will see uh, some some politician ruthless guy they are trying to show how good he helps the poor or try. all those things they're just for showbiz he'll put post on facebook and instagram and that's forgotten he has no other reward it's done all right but jesus's resurrection jesus's resurrection is what gives us life let me show you romans 425 romans 425 who was delivered for our offenses? Who? Jesus. And was raised again for our justification. You see? Jesus was raised for our justification. So if you put your trust in him, then you're justified. Absolutely. All right? So faith itself is not a good work. Faith is not a good work. That causes God to take notice of us. Faith is repenting of our sin by admitting that we are hopelessly and helplessly lost and unable to do anything by, uh, by our merit. And tell God, God now take control. I can't serve myself. That's faith. You tell God now, Jesus, I know now absolutely you died for my sins. You did all this for me. 
Please take control of me. Now, give me your life. Let me give you all the death and all the things that are, you know, that's faith. All right? That's how you accept salvation that God offers freely. We are saved by grace, not the work. Uh, and the, not our work. Because the work is God's. It's not ours. It's God's. Okay? Let me show you a verse here in Romans. Uh, Romans 4. Romans 4 verse 4. Okay? Romans 4 verse 4. He tells us, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. If you say that I'm going to work for this, I'm going to work so that I earn salvation. Like I've given you my story, being in church, doing good, acting in church, singing in church, preaching in church, doing everything good. To him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Everything I was doing, it was just debt. It was of nothing. Until, until you get saved. Now, when you do good after you're saved, all right, now that reward will you'll be given in heaven as rewards in the judgment seat of Christ. But now, if you do this to gain salvation, then you gain nothing. But to him that worketh not, you see, the one that worketh not, who does not work, does not put any of his own deeds, but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly, Jesus Christ, all right? His faith is counted for righteousness. Are you seeing this one? So when you when you put all your trust in God and you don't work anything, you say, God, is not about my works, it's not about anything. I've come to the cross, give me salvation. Then your faith is counted for righteousness. So here we see some two great truths. First, God justifies the ungodly, not people who have done their best and somehow elicited a gracious response from God. God justifies those who do not deserve it. Second, God justifies people who receive salvation by faith, not people who give it their best effort. Understood? If they are justified in any part based on what they do, they are receiving wages, not a gift. You see, salvation is a gift. It's not a wage. <laughs> okay? A wage is what you, you get after you work. So salvation is a gift. It's not a wage. All right? If grace is based on works to any degree, then it is not grace. Let me show you this. Romans 11, 6. Romans 11, verse 6. So if you have worked for your salvation, then it's not grace. It is, it is a, you know, something different. But, and if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. You see? So if it is works, let it be works all through. If it is grace, let it be grace all through. So you see, salvation is by grace, is not of works. But then, rewards in heaven after you've been saved, they are of your works. You work, you do good, you, you do help the poor, you preach the gospel, you do this and this, and then you'll get your rewards in heaven because you're already saved. But that one is not a point for your salvation. Your works are not a point for your salvation. You're not saved by works. Your works come later on for rewards. And so that God can take the glory and that you can have a good testimony. All right? So if it is of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. So if you say, oh, I'm just going to... Let's say you're saved, all right? Let me, let me differentiate these two. Let's say you're saved. You've already been saved by grace through faith, all right? And you sit down and you say... I'm just going to stay and uh, never read the Bible, never preach to anyone, never do any good thing, never do whatever, because it's all grace. Then uh, where are you going to get your rewards? You see, you have to do something. Work. Work. Preach to others. Tell the good news. Live a good testimony. Avoid temptations. Avoid this. And uh, those good works that you're doing, go to church, pray to people, you know, do these and, and uh, give to the poor, give to the needy, uh, support ministries of church and things like that. And when you do that, now you have rewards in heaven. Let's say, for example, there, there can be people who maybe they cannot preach like probably the, the, like the way I'm doing, but they can support different ministries. There are so many people online, even, even my channel and things like that. There are different people 
or even in your village or even in your town you can look at people who have the passion to go out and preach and tell them i want to support your ministry and to support what you're doing so that you can even preach much more all these things that we're using of course they are bought with money but our, our focus is not the money our focus is to preach more is to preach more and preach more maybe you cannot be able to go and preach like that but you can you can tell a brother or you can even be a prayer person you just pray for this me you just pray for them or maybe just be with them there just hold the microphone or you know connect the wires whenever they're preaching or something there's only something that you can do in the work of god and push his message ahead that's what we call work all right i don't know if you're getting the point here so we are saved by grace from the beginning to the end and once a person has come to the faith in Christ, he will undoubtedly realize that the only reason why he was able to have that faith is that God was drawing him even before he knew it. Because the Bible tells us it is the Holy Spirit who draws us, who draws us to God. All right. John 6 verse 44, it says, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him and I will raise him on the last day. So left to himself, the sinner would have continued to rebel and flee from God. Even before we believe, the very desire to come to God is God's grace at work to save us. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Remember in Psalms 3, 8, the Bible says salvation belongs to the Lord and your blessing be upon the people. Salvation is the Lord. It is God who saves. It is not you. All right, and also in Revelation 7 10 says, And cried out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and upon and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and to the Lamb. Because it is not us who give salvation, it is not our good deeds, it is a grace. Salvation belongs to God, He's the one who saves. All right, so salvation by grace means that from the first to last, it is undeserved. You don't deserve it. Personally, I never deserved it because I was just in church. I did everything that I could be able to do. Did I deserve salvation because I was in church? No. I was lost like any other lost person who is in church today. And I could have died and gone to hell. But God in his own mercies, even if I would not have been, have been in church and all those things, I could have, God could have caused different ways for me to be saved because it's not me. It's not me. To, to do something so that I can be saved. It is him in his own ways. There are people who are who they hear God's God's calling when they are uh, maybe they are murderers. They are, think about the Apostle Paul. He was heading to go and persecute people and God gave him that favor. Did Paul say get saved because he was a good man? No, actually he was persecuting the the, the believers. He was he was a bad man. Paul was a bad man. He was doing whatever he wants. So you see, it's not really about you. Salvation belongs to God. All right? It belongs to God. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. Like the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 12 verse 2. Look at this. The Bible tells us, looking unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. So, who gave us that faith? Who authored that? Jesus. Who planned everything? Jesus. Who gave us the favor? Jesus. Who gave us the grace? Jesus. Is the author and the finisher, the first and the last, the alpha and omega. Who for the joy that was set before him and do at the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God, of the throne of God. So Jesus is the one who set everything, not you, not me. Not you, not me, not anyone. So, being saved by grace, you have to understand it's that Jesus did everything for you. All right? Grace is not God doing 95 or 99.9 percent. .9 grace is basically God doing 100 percent. You just putting your faith on Him. All right? You have to understand that you there is nothing which you can do it is god doing a hundred out of a hundred on your case for salvation 
Now, do you understand what grace is? Do you believe the gospel? The gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, do you understand what Jesus did for you? He died for your sins, he was buried and rose again, as is written in the scriptures. He shed his blood for you, so that if you believe, he will give you that grace. All you need to do is put your faith in him. Hope this has been a blessing to you. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. Also, you can share to your friends. Also, uh, subscribe and check on the description below. We have other channels also at YouTube, BitChut and Facebook and, and things like that. Please check it, check them out and, and uh, also share to your friends. Let them hear the gospel. Let them hear the good news. All right. See you in the next one.